Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar. We are very excited to have you on. Um, my name is Timothy Tran and I'm a field marketer here in APAC at GitLab. Uh, so in today's webinar, we've got Jonathan joining us from Singapore, who will tell us more about why GitLab CICD uh, with five hacks to improve your current CICD setup, as well as special guest Rob Williams from my previous webinar, um, joining us to answer all your questions during the live Q&A at the end. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so the presentation and slides will be emailed to you after the webinar is finished. If you've got any questions during the presentation, please just type them in the chat box in your Zoom control panel below. Um, I'll compile them during the presentation and we'll give some time for Rob and Jonathan to answer all your questions at the end. Um, we'll also have a couple of polling questions to kick off the session. Uh, it'll just pop up on your screen and all you need to do is pick an answer that is most applicable to you. So let's get the show started, shall we? Um, I'd like to introduce to your Jonathan Lim. Um, he is a senior technical account manager at GitLab. Prior to joining GitLab, Jonathan worked in the big data analytics and application monitoring space. Uh, having seen the, the cost to rectify production issues, Jonathan wants to help organizations like yourselves adopt be DevOps best practices to fix problems earlier and quicker. We've also got Rob, our panelist for the Q&A. Um, he's an experienced DevOps engineering consultant who in the past has worked with large enterprise organizations to build and deploy web applications, as well as ro roll out digital workflow transformations before joining us here at GitLab, where he's been helping um, organizing organizations bring more modern DevOps best practices to more companies. Uh, Jonathan, please take it away. Great, hi everyone. Um, I'm just mon monitoring the chat. It looks like some people are having uh, issues with um, voice or something. Can you hear me all right, Tim? It's okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Anyone okay. else having problems? Ah, okay, I think just, just uh, one person. Okay, right, thanks, thanks for the feedback, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so um, I'll just move forward. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I was monitoring the chat because I think some people were having issues there. Um, so first and foremost, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so my name is Jonathan and uh, I have initially, um, uh, Tim has actually uh, introduced me. So just to get an idea about like, uh, the you know get a feel around the room like how everyone is comfortable um, with the topic on like CI/CD and DevOps. I have a few polling questions. Um, it would be great um, to get your feedback on that, so I can you know tailor my presentation in a way that uh, helps uh, that you know in if there are certain words that are more technical, so I might give a bit more of an explanation. So let's just get on with it. So with the first question is um, how familiar are you with um, continuous software development. So yeah, this again, it's anonymous. Um, it'd be, we just want to get an idea uh, on like what people are having. All right, so we have about 70, 80% of the people responded also. Let's just give, just give it a few more seconds. Right, um, so, so these are the poll results. I'm not sure if you can see the poll results, um, but uh, we, we basically have some level of familiarity. I think it's a little bit somewhat familiar, familiar and not familiar. Uh, so there are, there are, I, I guess a lot of people in this uh, call are quite familiar or at least know what DevOps is about. Uh, just two more questions about that. Um, so the second question would be, are you currently using GitLab CI/CD? Okay, 80% of people answering, we are pretty much neck to neck at yes and no. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's good to hear actually. Um, so, um, it'd be great. Um, so for maybe the folks that are using GitLab CI/CD, you can help us as well to 
uh, answer some of the questions if they appear on the chat as well. So we're getting, um, uh, for the poll results, we're getting pretty much neck to neck on about 50% yes, 50% no uh, on, on sort. And last but not least, the last question would be, how far are you along your DevOps journey from one just started to five very mature, uh, all your teams are using it. Um, and, um, you know, um, basically you're here to fact check whether I'm, I'm talking about the right things. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I, um, some, uh, most people, as I can see, are within the earlier stages uh, from one to three. Uh, which is great, I guess. And um, so I hope this session can be a little bit more informational about how we see it here at GitLab. Uh, and let's just move straight into the presentation. Um, right. So in 2011, Mark and Andresen, who was a former founder of Netscape, mentioned this. Cycle time compression may be the most underestimated force in determining winners and losers in tech. So what does this actually mean is that the quicker that you get feedback from your users, from your tests, the faster that you know you're off track. And therefore, that results in less time, less money and less effort that is wasted um, for you to get back on track, right? So in the past, as we, we know as software development lifecycle, we had the waterfall uh, methodology of how we develop products. Uh, there is, of course, the design stage where you get the designs from a, the end user, from the customer. And then you go on and then uh, six months later, you say, hey, customer, six months later, I'll come back to you with a prototype also and we'll discuss it. Six months on, when you reach the, when you have some prototype ready, uh, what happens is the customer might have moved into a different space. Their business might have evolved, their requirements might have evolved, and they come back and tell you, hey, you know, this is not what we want. Um, these are the new requirements that we need. But what have, in, in that scenario, you have basically wasted a lot of time because you are already moving in the wrong direction. That gave rise to the idea of like uh, agile methodologies um, in which you get to see your feedback faster. You don't have such long um, uh, iterations where, you, where, where iterations can be three months or six months long. But what you see is that um, you, um, in agile methodology, uh, you have a smaller number of features that you would develop on. You would then push them into production and you ask the customer for feedback quicker. Um, DevOps came around around the same time as uh, after agile methodologies came about, in which uh, you, you then have, you give power to the developers to allow them to be empowered to know how the feedback is like to, to not wait for, uh, to have it siloed teams where developers only develop and in your operations teams only just monitor the end, end product. So organizations then move to the next stage, right? So organizations who try to adopt DevOps, try to bunch of, buy a bunch of tools to help the organization. And they said, hey, you know, I just bought a bunch of tools, developers, here you go, please use it, automate it. You know, automation is always a very big word. Um, and then they want the developers to actually uh, adopt DevOps as a tool. But as we know, uh, or, or as uh, the polls, a lot of people do know about DevOps. DevOps isn't just about a tool. Uh, this sounds a bit um, hypocritical coming from a product company such as GitLab, um, but I still strongly believe that it, tools are just in aid in, in helping you to adopt a DevOps uh, uh, methodology at your workplace but it really boils down to really the people, processes, and the tools as really the last thing. Um, we can't really help you with the people and processes. Uh, we can have a chat later on, and then as a technical account manager, that's my job as to guide customers along that journey as well. Um, but today we're just gonna be talking about the tools and how we can simplify these tools for you. Uh, just as a side note, um, there's a very interesting book called The Phoenix Project that you can consider reading about DevOps. It's, not very heavy, it talks a little bit about DevOps in general and gives you high level overviews and it's uh, a little more engaging if you want to learn a bit about DevOps. But uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, I myself consider, I consider myself as a millennial. I, I mean, I am a millennial and I only had my first phone when I was like 14 or 15. Uh, back then it was a Nokia phone. Uh, it didn't have any uh, cool features. I only could play Snake on it. 
Uh, and in that, at that point in time, uh, we had dedicated features and functions for each different tool. So we had really good cameras from Nikon and Canon. Uh, we had uh, like MP3 players. We had a Walkman, which played your, your CDs and so on and so forth. Uh, we had dedicated computers, pages that did what they did really well, right? So they were very good in their own right. But what we ended up with was that we had so many devices. That came rise with the next component. So I think uh, the first one that we um, that I think a lot of people might think about is the first iPhone. The first iPhone was really where um, the uh, the where where you actually see all of these different tools come together in a single uh, in a single uh, device. So you had on an iPhone, you could have your phone, your calendar, your cameras, your your, your, you could see whether you could hear music, you could browse your web, and then you basically replace your alarm clocks uh, a lot of the time, right? Uh, in the first iteration of the iPhone, of course, the, the camera wasn't the greatest, but as you know, now we are, I, I don't even know where we are at now with the iPhone X or uh, 2X or so, something. Um, the, the, the features and functions have really uh, improved over time. So I think that's kind of where we see ourselves at GitLab to be in the same direction as um, we want to have an all-inclusive platform, right? A complete DevOps platform that, that runs end-to-end, -end, right? All the way from manage to plan, create, verify, package, secure, release, configure, monitor, and defend, all in a single, uh, it, all in a single platform, on in a single pane of glass where you can actually see everything all with using the same permission model so you don't have to integrate all your LDAPs with your many different tools so and so forth, all in a single data store. And that kind of simplifies it. And more often than not, we also preach about a lot about it in, within the company about collaboration between the tools. So if everyone is using the same tool, it doesn't leave a lot for, you know, um, how, how do you say, conflicts between teams, which is like, hey, you know, my tool says this, but your tool says a different thing. So having one single tool is what we then um, would uh, prefer or what we, what we uh, that's our vision for uh, uh, the DevOps life cycle. Unfortunately today, uh, as we are only going to be doing this for about half an hour or so, um, we, um, we will only focus on these three, three stages. Again, um, with me, we have Rob, who actually talked about a little bit about a different topic. We have Summer, which was the previous speaker as well, which talked about DevSecOps, uh, another topic in, in, in general. Uh, but what today we're going to talk about is these three stages, which is verify, package, and secure, or what most of us know as CICD. Um, uh, we will, this is an ongoing uh, webinar kind of session and then we'll be talking about new, uh, like other stages as well. So stay tuned if uh, uh, those are the things that you're more interested in. So let's uh, define what CICD is. Um, so CICD in a very, very um, short uh, definition of so, so it embodies a culture set of operating principles and collection of practice that enable application teams to deliver code changes frequently and reliably. I think one thing to note here is that you don't see the word tools, right? So again, I want to emphasize this even com coming from a company that sells a tool, is that tools are just a way to help you to enable that culture, that operating principles. And um, hopefully through today, uh, I will share with you some tips or some tips that our larger customers uh, at GitLab are using today that help them to actually adopt these principles a bit better. By the way, yeah, um, I think, uh, by the way, uh, I think uh, Rob and Tim and, and the rest of them are monitoring the uh, chat. So feel free to ask any questions. If you, um, you, you don't have to ask the questions at the end of the presentation, you can ask it throughout, but we will address them at the end of the presentation as well. So why CICD? So, why do people use CI/CD? Because obviously it uh, detects errors faster, it reduces integration problems, it allows teams to develop faster, and most, uh, most uh, and first and foremost is it helps you to, de to deliver value as quickly as possible. Um, GitLab has its own way of CI/CD or the way that we actually um, have a methodology around its CI/CD. 
And this is uh, to understand it first is to understand the GitLab flow. So right in the middle here, you do see uh, the master branch. So the master branch is where uh, how a lot of people see as the source of truth. When you were to actually make a code change, you were to actually develop something new in terms of your uh, 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 a new feature for your application, uh, you can create an issue first, and then that would, uh, as well as a merge request, you commit your changes, your CI pipeline runs, uh, you then have your security scans uh, and all your other tests that you have in, in your pipeline. You review the applications, you approve the changes based on your team lead or how your approval changes uh, are, and then you merge it back into master. Right. So how we see this works is that this is the GitLab's flow, and this is the cornerstone to how GitLab continually integrates and deploy. Right. Why is this important? Because you know a lot of the times when developers they develop on their own laptop or my MacBook machine also, you know it works fine. The code works completely fine on my MacBook machine because it's a, a lab environment, right? So there are no external factors. There are no, you know, uh, networking factors. There's no like uh, uh, other factors that involve like even for your for your your web applications or or how you integrate with other tools. So having the, the following this GitLab flow to test it even before you work, merge it into master is very important in our case. Sidetracking a little bit, um, that's the whole idea of DevSecOps. DevSecOps, uh, as Summer, uh, the, our, our senior architect uh, that's based out in Melbourne, uh, talked about in our previous webinar, um, that's also really important. Um, so as you can see here, we have the GitLab CI, so you actually integrate continuously. The other portion of it is the security testing in the pipeline. So following back on my previous slide, which is about the, um, the GitLab flow. So you test all your, or you test for your security vulnerabilities, you test for your, um, your license compliance, you, you test for your code management, so on and so forth. And then you give the feedback directly to the developer even before um, it gets released to the security team, right? So get this, this empowers or has the idea of shifting left to empower the developers to actually get a feedback on whether the, the, the new features and functions that they are actually uh, developing is in compliance, has no security issues, uh, so on and so forth. Right. So again, I can't really uh, go too deep into this topic, um, but if you would like to have a chat about it, let us know uh, and, and we can have a separate uh, conversation about it. Um, expanding a little bit about the GitLab CI CD workflow. So within the continuous integration component, you can have it, uh, as I mentioned earlier, your code quality test, your performance test. You can integrate with your third party uh, tests as well. If you, if you have like JUnit testing, um, you have unit testings available uh, in your own flavors. You can definitely put it as part of your uh, CI pipeline. Um, and then you can use uh, the, the, the features that are available from GitLab, which is like container scanning, dependency scanning, fast testing, which is something that we've added recently as well to our security stack. Um, and moving on to the next component of it. So like your package registry or how you manage your packages for uh, Maven and NPM and even to your release stages uh, where you integrate with uh, technologies such as Kubernetes uh, for your canary deployments and all, right? So today is gonna be a very high level overview. I have I am not able to go through every single feature of them, but if that's something that's interesting to you and you wanna have a discussion, we can always have that later on. Um, so in general, how we see our CI CD pipelines is this. Um, firstly, there are the main stages. You have the stage for build, test, uh, review, and deploy. And these are just some example stages that you can have as part of your CI CD pipeline. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's limited to only these four. You can have custom stages as well if you want. You can have build, uh, you can have you can split up these stages as you need to, and you have can have many multiple number of jobs in these stages uh, that can run in parallel or uh, you know, uh, only after or sequentially after one stage of after one job has finished. Right, so that kind of gives, gives an overall or like a um, high level overview in terms of setting the ground in what GitLab believes in CICD and how we actually see the DevOps landscape to be in our own words. Uh, the next thing that we want to talk about, which is basically the meat of the 
uh, presentation is the five hacks, right? So um, what led me to even come up with this topic in the first part is actually um, observing customers and talking to a lot of the people such as Rob and Summer and a lot of my colleagues as well. What are the customers, what are customers asking for today? Uh, or what are customers facing problems and challenges in their organizations today that has led us to um, this topic, which is um, five hacks. Um, so um, first, let's go on to it. So first things first is the problem where customers always come back to us is that uh, first things, it, 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 as the poll suggests, so some of you, you guys, some of um, your teams are having issues with, or you find it very imposing, very difficult to switch to DevOps. Um, one of the reasons why is that uh, a lot of them, uh, you don't have the proper resources, you don't have the proper um, people with the correct tool sets um, to be able to adopt these DevOps practices or, these, uh, or to adopt CICD. It involves a very steep learning curve and I agree to a, very, uh, to a large extent, but how do we solve this problem? All right, so I'm just gonna go through all the problems first and uh, the next few slides will actually talk about the issues. Uh, the next one is how do we ensure consistency of our application builds over multiple cloud environments? As a lot of uh, companies are moving to the cloud native environments also, ensuring consistency over across Azure, AWS, across GCP is getting more and more difficult and how do we help that? Uh, number three, um, how do we handle secrets and environment environmental variables as per company guidelines or even by audit guidelines per se. Uh, number four, how do we effectively run, test, monitor applications um, that involves microservices and multiple technologies, uh, especially when we work in silos uh, in a development unit. Right, so these are some of the problems that we see or customers come back to us and ask us how can GitLab help in this scenario. And uh, these are some of the solutions that we think or some customers that adopt these solutions and we think that might really help in this case. Um, right, so first solution, simplify your CICD. Uh, the steep learning curve, uh, you don't have the proper tool sets and, and, and all that. Uh, developers find it very stressful to actually learn deployment codes such as your, deploy, uh, your Jenkins, uh, Jenkins file or even writing in GitLab CI. So before I start, um, maybe just to have a bit of, uh, does anyone know what this tool is that I'm showing on the screen here? Mixer, I, I see Mixer. Any other guesses also? Um, ah, okay. All oh, right, I, I see a lot of people know what they're talking about. Okay, filter, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I think that, yeah, there are many people who actually know what this does. Um, so yeah, this is actually a thermomix and if, if, if you like squint, uh, oh, we even have the actual model, which is uh, TM5, right? So, uh, so, so if you squint hard enough, you can actually see the brand on it. Uh, this is not a product placement, uh, nor are we sponsored in any way. Uh, but what this tool actually does is that it's a food processor and cooker per se. So it's an all-in-one blender, cooker, bread maker, and it basically is is able to uh, cook anything. It has, it has basically over 600 recipes that you can actually cook. Um, and all you need to do is just put in the, uh, the ingredients and you'll actually cook the dish for you. Right, so that's pretty amazing, right? And I, I, I think set, set it to forget it. Okay, right, I, I see there are some uh, fan, uh, fan boys or fan girls out there uh, that really like this too. So in, in the same vein of thread, uh, I, I think where we are coming from is that we also believe that, you know, we don't want these things to, we want to automate some of these things. We want to make it easy. So what, how, would ni how, how nice would it be if you were to be able to actually, you know, uh, you, you can sense what the ingredients are, so, and then automatically help you to deliver the end product as we go. I guess that's where we come in with um, the idea of auto DevOps. So with auto DevOps is the idea that all you need to do is commit code, push code, and GitLab will automate the rest for you, right? So what GitLab does is that if you push a, a code in a proper format, and of course there are some configurations that uh, to be done. I'm not gonna give you the, the, the sales pitch, it's like, oh, just put it and everything's fine, but there are some uh, very basic uh, configurations that you need to do, um, and it will automatically help you to create these stages. So from create, 
merging and building to verifying code quality testing security in different uh, ways also uh, for packaging for releasing configuring and monitoring um, if some of these things are set up properly and that's what we think is the best way to bring these best practices to develop to delivering software uh, this is an example when I uh, basically use a template of a, a Spring Boot um, application that's written in Java. So I, I, I didn't write any CI file, I didn't do anything, I just start with a template and automatically it would help me to, and I run a pipeline, it would help me to actually set up these stages for me. Uh, depending on what kind of different technologies you are using, we would then have different pipelines as well um, that, that will help, us, help you to set it up accordingly. Right. So that's my first uh, thing, Auto DevOps. Auto DevOps again, it can be used in conjunction with your um, with with uh, your customized CI pipelines as well. It's not just the case where you just have to use Auto DevOps and you know it's a fire and forget. Uh, you can use it in conjunction, and but it what I'm trying to um, drive at is that it's a good start point, right? So for teams who do not know what to do at the start and are trying to adopt DevOps practices, that's a good start point. Um, for you to start and to get that feedback um, quick enough. All right, so that's one down. There's a four others more to go. So point two, effective deployment of cloud native um, applications. So how do we ensure standardizations of deployment across multiple cloud providers and deploying on native app uh, uh, applications on cloud native, right? So, um, this is typically how a lot of uh, um, developers or if, like a lot of our customers that make use of uh, GitLab. Uh, and, and in this problem is that maybe they do have a GitLab instance, they have, and they, they have many projects, right? And they have many projects and they span across uh, multiple um, product uh, as in cloud vendors. So they might be deploying to um, Amazon, so AWS or Google, uh, GCP, as well as Microsoft Azure. Uh, and they have different technologies. They might be trying to use GitLab to, as GitOps um, to actually deploy infrastructure as code or even application uh, as code. But it's very, very difficult to actually um, ensure that this standardization happens. So why, why is that difficult? Say, for example, if uh, your application now support Nginx um, 9.0 or so, but uh, Nginx, com Nginx comes up with a new uh, version of it. How do we ensure that that is standardized across all your three different cloud vendors? How do we ensure that all our application adheres to all these security best practices within the organization as well? So um, we at GitLab, I think we leverage on a few different uh, methodologies or tools as part of our DevOps process. And first things first is the idea of build packs. Right. So the answer to that is build pack. So we started out with a Heroku open source based project that's called uh, Heroku-ish. And now we are moving actually to a new standard for um, cloud native uh, build packs. Right. So in, in a nutshell, what uh, Heroku-ish or Heroku and uh, cloud native build packs do is that when you deploy code, uh, what it does is it analyzes the code, it selects the build packs, or if you have certain assigned build packs to um, your, 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 your code, retrieves the assets, help you to compile the code, and then create an, an, an app slug for you um, to actually deploy into your environments. Um, in conjunction, leveraging with a Helm charts and auto DevOps, um, it can then help you to de deploy straight into production or your UAT or testing environments uh, in this case. Right, so that's part one of how we can actually enable that, um, that, um, that uh, uh, standardization. Why is this important? Because um, build packs, firstly, they help you to maintain a control between the apps and the developers to ensure that standardization for, it also allows for compliance. There's very little uh, effort and intervention when you're using build packs. And, uh, and as well as why, why are we, I, I think that one of the questions that we, we, we got is that why are we moving away from Herokuish to actually uh, cloud native build packs? Um, so first things first, uh, Herokuish is a open source project that's maintained by the community. We are not sure um, when uh, support will stop or when people are actually not going to contribute to this project anymore. 
Um, at the same time, we also, it, it wasn't, Herukuish wasn't born out of a cloud native background. Um, so the Docker images are a little bit larger and they're the long, and, our, and uh, in our team, we actually uh, monitored and the build times are a little bit longer. So moving on towards uh, uh, something that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is working on is something that is more cloud native. It's a bit lightweight and the build times would then uh, improve uh, accordingly. Uh, and that would also help you to speed up um, your efficiency and um, automation uh, process uh, with Auto DevOps. Okay. So that's part 1A of it. So part, uh, part 2A of it, part 2B of it is actually our Kubernetes integration, right? So uh, we believe very strongly and we, we, we invest heavily in integrating with Kubernetes to actually have some of these dashboard to get that feedback early on, right? So having the deploy bots, canary deployments, um, including auto DevOps, Kubernetes monitoring and uh, integrations with web terminals, that's where we are, have, we, we are at with Kubernetes integrations. And what you get to see out of it is like um, how, how fast or how uh, having a little bit more control and a little bit more um, view into your deployment bot, uh, models. So part of your CD component where you can actually see how many instances or how many pods are up and running in your Kubernetes deployment. Um, you can actually also see in terms of your canary deployments on production, um, are they working fine? Are they up and running? Uh, you can also monitor it directly in uh, for your node metrics, um, such as your uh, average memory utilizations and CPU utilizations. And all of these ones are all available in the GitLab platform. So you don't have to switch to a separate tool set, like um, using a, maybe a Kibana or Grafana dashboard to actually view all of these statistics and metrics. You can see them all directly in the um, GitLab platform. So again, going back to the idea of having a single DevOps uh, 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 platform where you can see end-to-end -end in terms of like your feedback and, and, and all that. Right, so that's point number two. Okay, so first one we talked about auto DevOps um, to, to actually go, um, uh, to actually climb, uh, to go past that, that, that mountain of like, you know, adoption. Uh, the second one we talk about how to maintain that standardization. And number three, handling multiple pipeline projects. So over here in the screen, if you can see here, this is the basic GitLab application architecture. Um, you have multiple components such as, you know, your, your Nginx, your workhorse, your um, uh, unicorn that's running on R Ruby on Rails, you have Redis, so and so forth. So this is an architecture that might be very familiar to you, uh, even in your organizations where you have multiple services or microservices that are talking to each other and teams in general wouldn't be working on every single part of this uh, architecture. So you have a team that maybe will, will be working on Unicorn and another team that's working on your workhorse, right? But how do we test this effectively? So at GitLab, we do a lot of, um, uh, we, do, uh, we, we, make use of we, we make use of our own products and we are able to actually test this in, in, in parallel, right? So able to test on our own application and how it interacts with uh, different applications, right? So that might be the same at your organization or that's what a lot of our customers are talking about where application teams might want to see how my new code that, I've been, uh, that I'm pushing in, how it interacts with a different component, a different, uh, 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 yeah, a different component when, when uh, something new gets pushed up. That gives rise to the whole idea of multi-project pipeline. So you specify a branch, you can pass variable, variables from uh, to downstream pipelines. And if downstream pipeline fails, it will not fail the upstream pipelines. How do we do it? Um, so in your CI pipelines, you can actually specify a, a new stage called bridging. And in that new stage called bridging, uh, bridge, sorry, um, you can then specify the project branches and your strategy on how you actually want this to run. Uh, what it would look like in your CI CD pipeline would be this. So firstly, you have your initial branch that may be written in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it could be running on Ruby on Rails. So it goes through the entire build process. It actually deploys all the way to your downstream. And then once everything passes, it would then uh, actually uh, trigger the downstream project, which is another project in GitLab to actually run their own tests and their own CI pipeline. 
yeah, so that's how we deal with multiple projects and a lot of uh, these days, like advanced projects that you know have microservices that are talking to each other. So that's point number three, right? So we we we've also covered the the issue on like how do we test effectively for multiple projects, uh, and fourth, right? So how do we optimize resources using GitLab rules? So so prior to rules that GitLab, prior to actually 12.3, uh, there were only conditionals that we could allow. So for own, uh, we had conditionals that allow you to specify only or accept uh, into your in in into uh, your conditionals. Uh, and after 12.3, we actually changed the rules a little bit better. So it's a lot of an improvement after 12.3. So we provide the users a bit more control um, when on how CI pipeline should run. Um, we understand that compute resources are very expensive. And if you maximize your um, uh, resources, um, you can save a lot of money, right? So you don't, maybe certain stages, you don't want it to run for, uh, you, you, can have, you can specify text for certain CI pipelines. Uh, where, for example, if you had, it will be part of this conditional, it doesn't run and it therefore saves a lot of computation power. So I had a previous colleague at my uh, previous uh, company that was telling me that a certain large MNC in Korea uh, was spending approximately about $800 million uh, on AWS spending uh, in Korea. So I think that's one of the biggest problems that a lot of large organizations these days face which is trying to reduce their compute spend um, and how to actually have more control on, on, on these things. Uh, it's, it's very important. All right. So even in GitLab, uh, prior to 12.3, we had a lot of these kind of errors. So uh, you would commit a certain code and that certain code might, uh, because, it was, because of the tags that you placed in and because it was a merge request as well, it could potentially run two parallel CI jobs at the same time, running exactly the same thing. Uh, that number one is a waste of resources. You don't want to spawn CI jobs uh, both at the same time because they are basically running the same things. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to make your runners busy uh, in this case. So how do we actually put rules into our CI pipelines, right? So this is another hack that we, we, we use or, or, or that we suggest moving on from uh, on, just using only or, or accept is to use rules in your blocks. So specifying a rules in your block and specifying your, your conditional. So for example, in this case, if your CI pipeline source equals to web, then it would then run the script as it says. Uh, there are a lot of clauses. So just now we mentioned in our previous example, there is the if clause that you can use. There are also other clauses such as changes or exist. And there are other operators that you can use um, to actually specify your GitLab uh, CI uh, to have that additional control also. So some of the ones that, uh, that are very uh, popular is say, for example, if, you, uh, if, if the environment is you are deploying on is to uh, production, then there are only certain type of jobs that would kick in. If you are not, if you're only uh, deploying to a test environment, then you can only spend, you, you, you'll be only running a certain set of jobs. Um, again, this is one of the example. So in this example, you can see that um, in this job, for example, if the CI pipeline source is a merge request event, or if it's a scheduled uh, project, so you can then have the control to actually run the script, um, hello, hello world or echo hello rules, right, in this case. So there are a lot more examples, uh, but we, I don't have the time to actually go through all the different examples also. So uh, just do a quick Google and you probably can see what uh, some of these examples are uh, in terms of your CI pipelines. Okay, so the last, last but not least, I think it's uh, environmental variables and secret management. Um, and I think this is really uh, important today. So over here on my screen, you can see, uh, I hope no one here is working for, uh, this is not a call out to the company. So if you're working for like Facebook, T-Mobile or like uh, Robinhood, uh, this, isn't, it, this isn't like trash talking, but I think the idea behind it is uh, what we want to talk about is uh, that a lot of people, uh, we, we, we still today uh, face the problem of having to store a lot of our passwords in clear text and we don't do them in a proper manner. 
um, not only just passwords, but also environmental variables that might be crucial in terms of connecting to your environments in the cloud or even your on-prem or certain other features and functions, right? So um, GitLab, so, during, so that, this is a very important component and I think this component also ties in greatly into how we actually manage these secrets as well as these environmental variables well enough. So I'll talk about two areas that you can actually um, control these variables. So first one is under your CI CD uh, settings. As part of your variables, you can actually specify your variables here. Uh, and if you can see the, var the values here, actually, uh, you can't actually see them. You can review these uh, values and the, and you can, con you can control like who can see these uh, variables um, via um, RBAC sources, so a uh, role-based access uh, sources, so maybe only the admins can see it. But if you are a guest user or you're a developer, you can't see these variables. Um, and then you can also control it in a way where certain variables are only activated for certain pro uh, branches, right? So you can have the idea of protected branches versus unprotected branches where these variables will only be accessible or you can actually call these variables if you're only on a protected branch. So that's one way of actually uh, managing these secrets or these uh, environmental variables. Um, so say for example, if you are not, if some of these variables are not so confidential or not so secure, you don't need it to be secure, you can definitely put it directly into your GitLab CI file as well as a variable and you, uh, you can then reference it uh, from that point onwards. But what we see here is that um, there is another component which is uh, highly requested by a lot of our customers as well as uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of our customers and a lot of people are starting to use this in our latest version as well is integrations with external uh, secrets in CI. So uh, as of our last, uh, our last release also, we've actually had achieved um, um, vault integrations with HashiCorp. Uh, so uh, as you can see from the diagram here, this is basically how you can use an external secrets application uh, to actually do that whole authentication process and not store it within GitLab if that's how your organization sees it to be. Um, I've also had some conversations with other um, customers and there were there are interests in other secrets management uh, tool sets such as maybe Cyber Vault as well and so on and so forth, right? So I think we've only started on this journey relatively new. So um, I think uh, as an open source company also, um, I would suggest if you would uh, want to see a certain feature from us, um, please create an issue on our, uh, through, through GitLab uh, and then, you know, suggest why, why this is important. And then I think our developers, our product managers will then, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll pick all of these up and then they will start to focus their development efforts on actually supporting uh, these technologies as part of our secrets management. Right. So I guess that's pretty much it from my point. So that's point number five. Um, and these are just five hacks uh, or five tips that, uh, that some organizations that are using GitLab are using, um, that they are doing it today. Um, and I suggest that you give it a try or uh, if you are using, if you're already a GitLab CI user, CI CD user, um, or if you're not, you know, there's always the free trial that you can take up on and you can always try it in your organization. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it from me and I think we can move on to the next part which uh, I will let Rob take over. Awesome. Um, thanks for that, Jonathan. Very insightful presentation. Um, you know, it's great to hear all those tips and tricks and I hope everyone has a lot to take away from this. Um, so if you guys got some time, um, you know, stick around for the Q&A. Um, first off, we'll start off with a question from Lewis. Um, is Auto DevOps available on the self-hosted version? Yeah, definitely. So, so I actually saw this one uh, get answered in the chat as well. So some people are already on top of it, right? Um, Auto DevOps is, is totally available in the self-hosted version. It's um, the, the Auto DevOps can basically be thought of as a set of templates that, uh, that all work together to create one pipeline. But then uh, in addition to that pipeline being working both in the, the SaaS version and on-prem, you can then componentize the jobs and create custom pipelines from it. Great. Um, any, 
what, what's the difference between GitLab um, and SpinMaker, like from a CI/CD perspective? Yeah, well, like from, from the CI/CD perspective, um, there's there's some things like like the auto DevOps pipelines, right? Like um, things like uh, integrating tightly with Kubernetes and some of our operations dashboards. So a lot a lot of the the biggest benefits that you're going to see with GitLab versus a tool like Spinnaker do, is sort of around the edges of the CI/CD uh, space, right? Because we integrate with the fully with the the create tools, fully with the monitoring tools, and that sort of thing. Um, and and that lets us do things like the feature flags and the, the secret management that Jonathan was talking about earlier. Definitely. Um, is it possible to have multiple pipelines in the same respiratory? Um, in the case we have multiple apps in the same repo? That's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And it's uh, a, a use case that, that can happen a lot, especially in the old like um, sort of mono repo structure that, that uh, a lot of repo repositories still are in. Um, and, and the best answer to that question is that uh, while there can't be two explicitly defined pipelines per se, what you can do is dynamically change how uh, the, the jobs run so that uh, they, they only run when certain conditions are met. And what that, that has, uh, ends up being is a, a very dynamically generated uh, pipeline that can run different jobs based on different factors so that when you push up a job, it might have a, an environment variable set and then that can trigger the jobs that, that you need to run to run and the ones that you don't want to run can be turned off. Perfect. Um, so what do you recommend for handling secrets in GitLab pipelines and on developers' local machines? Having secrets stored in pipeline CI settings doesn't allow for easy updating or changing. I mean, that doesn't help for secret um, management on developer desktops. Um, does GitLab have a solution or should we look into tools like HashiCorp Vault? Uh, look, like even if you, if you go and get uh, HashiCorp Vault, right? If the developers are still putting the, the passwords on their desktops, then, then HashiCorp's not gonna be able to help you too much. Um, what, what, what we talked about, right? The, um, the, the secret management in the, uh, the project variables, what Jonathan was talking about earlier, is the, the recommended way of working within, um, within GitLab. Uh, but the, the HashiCorp Vault integration as well is, is very uh, deep and like, it actually it works very well and very seamlessly to, to get your secrets uh, in and out of uh, Vault into your environments and pipelines. Cool, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so how do you put, put an approval method in pipeline for a particular job? Interesting, so, so uh, the job will have certain success or failure criterias, right? So a job is considered to be successful when it reaches the end of its of the pipeline script. So for each pipeline job, there's a, a set of instructions that, that the, the GitLab runner machine will run. And then uh, if it successfully reaches the end of that, then it's a successful job. If there's some sort of error that gets raised by your script before that happens, or there's some sort of some, something gets raised and some sort of exit code gets given, then that's uh, a, condi a failure condition for that job. Right. Um, this one's a good one. Um, we get this quite a lot. Is GitLab CI faster than GitHub Action? Um, how do you compare? Well, it really, it really depends on like what you're doing, right? So. Uh, in, in terms of like, uh, the only thing that I can sort of point to, to, to compare us is the, the analyst reports, right? Um, and, and GitLab CI is the, the number one continuous integration tool on the market at the moment. So that's going up against the likes of Jenkins, the likes of uh, GitHub Actions. So that's, uh, yeah, let, let the credentials speak for themselves, I suppose. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so how do you, how, how do you block the GitLab CI YML to be edited while merging from another branch? Well, when the, 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 the way that you do that is, is by enabling merge approvals on, on the merge requests, right? It's impossible to, to stop any individual file from being changed in the Git repository. Right, that's the whole point of the Git repository is that you uh, you get you get like the version control. You see all the different versions, 
Um, in order to stop the, the pipeline from sort of changing and, and this sort of thing, and especially in terms of like um, long living branches, they get merged in after a while when there, there could have been like lots and lots of changes based on um, other, other branches. Um, there's this concept of merge trains within GitLab CI, which allows you to set specific merge requests as uh, prerequisite for other merge requests. So that means that if there is a change, then uh, it has to go through that merge train first and make sure that all of the, um, all of the merges have been put in. I see, I see in the chat, could also try file locking. Um, yeah. Great. Um, does GitLab have a solution to auto deploy Jira custom plugins automatically to running Jira instance? Uh, at the moment, I think that that still has to be configured. You have to configure the the um, the, the integration there. But but once you do have it integrated, there is a, a full range of features, including closing GitLab t uh, Jira tickets from the the GitLab uh, interface when you push commit stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, got another comment and question from Lewis. Um, in my case, I have ten .NET APIs in the same repo and dev stage production branch, should I use conditions on the pipeline file to trigger the build for a specific folder from a specific branch origin? Yeah, definitely. So that's, that's one of the most common um, uh, usages of the GitLab rules is having specific branches run specific jobs. So we can see this in the, the auto DevOps pipeline. One of, the, one of the cool things it does is it has a, a separate pipeline for master versus uh, for every other branch and on the master branch uh, in addition to all of the the regular jobs your your build your code quality all of our security scanning um, Including the the auto review app for the dynamic application security testing. It'll then deploy to a staging environment and Then have the, the option to, to have either incremental rollout timed incremental rollouts to print to a production environment uh, manual deployment to a production environment or even canary uh, production to a deployment to a production environment. And then after that deployment, it even has uh, performance testing built in. So that, th those are some of the things that are just specific on the master branch there. So uh, you can definitely like pick up individual jobs for specific branches, uh, especially in the, the dev stage prod branch branching model. Right. Um. So parent-child parent, um, pipeline seem to track the entire results compared to multi-projects with triggers. Do you have any roadmaps um, of providing consistent view on them? Uh, so so as, as you said, there's no like uh, upper level view. You can you simply have to like navigate up and down to the, the parent-child pipelines because they, they are separate projects and they, they have a separate context. So uh, I think that at the moment there's like, they're just trying to maintain that, uh, that sort of context there. So I'm, I'm not sure about a, a timeline for providing a, a more global view on them. I mean, Jonathan, you heard anything? Um, yeah, I, I think I agree on that point. I think they, um, they, they want to see that separation. Um, but at the same time, you know, if it's something that you think is useful, you know, submit a issue on our project and uh, our product leads will probably take a look at them. I mean, it's a good point to add as well. So, yeah. Um, does GitLab support Open Road by Acton? Open Road. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I haven't I haven't heard of that. Um, uh, depending on what it does, potentially. Um, um, yeah, I haven't heard of this one as well. So. Um. Okay, we can come back to it later. Um, so, does GitLab support versioning? Uh, so, so in terms of versioning, so so for GitLab is a version control piece of software. Uh, one of one of our well, one of the functions of GitLab is as a version control software, right? Um, that that sits in the the create uh, DevOps stage. So so we've broken it down to the 10, 10 DevOps lifecycle stages. And and Jonathan here has really been focusing on the the verify uh, package and release stages, uh, which lets you uh, enact pipelines on individual commits and branches within the, the version control software. 
So based on that, you can definitely have uh, lots and lots of different versions up and running just being managed by GitLab. Yeah, definitely. I'm um, just wrapping up with the last few questions now. Um, so this is a question from Baskaran. I have a, I have the same question on Dask. Um, we have re been requested for function ID from GitLab. How to create the function ID in GitLab? Um, function ID. I know I haven't run into any any requests like that. Um, Jonathan, have you have you seen anything happening in terms of a function ID? I haven't, I haven't seen any. Sort yeah, of like I haven't seen that as well. It, yeah, we probably need a bit more context on that. It's a bit hard yeah. to, uh, you know, because I think it's quite specific. Yeah, uh, feel free to shoot us through an email um, with yeah. more details, and then yeah, we can get definitely get back to you on that. Um, next question: How effective is met metrics performed by GitLab CI? Um, can you list the types of metrics that GitLab CI is performing? So specifically for the GitLab CI itself, it performs uh, some lot, lot, lots of security and code quality metrics. So it provides a code climate report, a vulnerability list. So that's a vulnerability list both for vulnerabilities found in your code as well as any libraries that your code's using. Um, found in from static application security testing and dynamic application security testing. Um, on top of that, it provides uh, metrics about what licenses are being used by your uh, project. So it, it shows you all the different licenses that are being used by the various uh, libraries that you're using within there and brings all of that into the, the merge request so that you can sort of see all of those metrics are provided to the developer at, uh, at build time. Um, on top of that, there, there's uh, some uh, analytics given about the GitLab CI itself, right? Um, there's a CI insights panel, which has uh, the, like over, over a period of time, you can see the number of successful pipelines, how many minutes CI pipeline minutes you're using, that sort of thing. So you can get an idea of um, if your pipeline's getting more or less successful, or if you're using more or how, how that's trending. There's a, there's a fair bit of analytics there. There's quite a, quite a few metrics there. Um, just to wrap it up, one final question. At what step is it recommended to run container security tests? So, so GitLab recommends that we run that in the verify stage. So uh, if we think back to, to Jonathan's uh, DevSecOps workflow, the, the new workflow this is the, the shift left in security. So moving it out of that uh, uh, an end stage in release and moving it more into the verify stage that happens in every commit. Definitely. Yeah, so look, just to wrap up, um, this brings us to the end of the webinar. Keep an eye out for the next topic. Um, we'll be talking about closing the feedback loop for a better stage planning, uh, which covers things like better portfolio management through roadmap planning and burn down charts, um, granular task planning through multi-level epics, and how to use uh, how to make use of value stream analytics. Um, so look, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, I hope you all got a lot out of it as much as um, we enjoyed providing this information to you. Um, look, in saying that, we'd like to hear your feedback about these webinars so far. Um, we'll drop a link in the chat um, below with a survey link. If you all could fill that out for us, um, just to let us know, you know, what, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what you'd like to see in, um, in these sort of webinars. Um, yeah, that'll be great. So again, just a reminder that the webinar is being recorded um, and we'll send you through a copy of this after the webinar has finished. All right. Thanks everyone. See you later. Thanks, Thank you.